Welcome to Trade Ideas. I'm Jake Merle, sitting down with Tavi Costa, Global Macro Analyst at Crestcat Capital. Tavi, it's great to have you on the show for your very first Real Vision interview. Thank you, Jake. I appreciate it. Looking forward. So before we get into your actual trade idea for today, can you please go over your background, who you are, and what you do at Crestcat Capital? Sure. I've been working for Crestcat for about six years, and uh, um, I usually focus more on the global macro research and help Kevin Smith, our CIO, on the portfolio management part. And Crestcat's investment process really revolves around uh, building fundamental equity macro models. And uh, uh, essentially, that is, is how we develop our investment themes. And any point in time, we have about three investment uh, high conviction ideas in the portfolio. Today, we have three. So that's uh, one would be the US stocks that are historically overvalued. And the second one would be China being the largest credit bubble we've seen in history. And the third one would be um, the precious metals, which is what I want to talk about today. Uh, precious metals is what we see as a tremendous value with uh, with the turning in the business cycle, which we think it's going to happen anytime soon. Um, so we'd like to elaborate further on this. So what are you looking at specifically that's showing you it's a good time to be bullish on precious metals? Sure. So today, more of a big macro picture with uh, we put out this chart looking at uh, historical imbalances in, uh, in total debt to GDP of, of the last largest uh, credit bubbles we've had in the last 30 years, uh, all, all the way going back to the 1990s with Japan, 1997 with the Asian crisis, and uh, U.S. Uh, housing bubble in 07, 08, and the European debt crisis in 2011 and 2010. And what you find there is that if you calculate the average of those imbalances at the peak of those bubbles, it was somewhere around the 245 uh, percent of total debt to GDP. And if you looked at the, the top largest uh, total debt to GDP ratios today, or of 2018, because that's the most recent data you can get, you get somewhere close to an average of 270%. So um, you looked at that imbalance. It's not a macro indicator uh, for timing. However, when you put that together, usually when you have excessive amounts of that, uh, it, it tends to, to cause destruction of value of global uh, fiat currencies. And when you put that together with the uh, monetary base, the size of monetary base today and money supply globally relative to above ground gold, and then you kind of line up with all the macro indicators that we have today, uh, which I'm going to be talking about soon, that, that makes us really believe that gold and precious metals in, in essentially look very attractive as a, as a long here um, in any portfolio, really, as a hedge. The second part of it, which I think is quite interesting, is we put out the stats looking at the percentage of, of companies that are losing money on a free cash flow basis uh, globally. So it's across countries. And what you find there is that no financial stocks for Canada, for instance, uh, are losing uh, about 82% of those companies in, in Canada are losing money on a free cash flow basis. And Australia is about 71%. And then you have the US, uh, Hong Kong, and China, and Singapore, right about 60% of those companies are losing money. In it makes you think about this whole uh, market that's being propped up by central banks with the ultra low interest rate environment. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of an impossible scenario if you had a sort of a normalized uh, cost of capital situation with more normalized rates, you would never be able to uh, survive in a situation like that. So enabling companies, zombie companies to be alive, it's, it's quite, of a, quite of a distortion really. And it's really, uh, if you think about it, there's another way uh, that, that central banks have kind of propped up markets and the credit markets essentially. Uh, which is the 30-year yields. When you look at 30-year yields, uh, essentially if, compared to Fed funds rate, which is an overnight rate, uh, what's, what's interesting about that is that it, it inverted by, uh, in 14 economies. So 14 economies that have their 30-year yields lower than Fed funds rate. When you see that throughout history, we put out this chart looking at throughout history, every time this, uh, this spread reaches an extreme on the negative side, we're at the peak of a cycle. So we had that in the tech bubble, we had that in the housing bubble, and we're now having this issue today. But what's unique about it is that we're having this problem in 14 economies. We never had, it's really an unprecedented amount of countries having this issue. And there's really three takeaways from this chart. Number one, it's a global yield curving version, which we think it's negative for stocks. Number two is it makes you think about U.S. rates being relatively high when compared to other global rates in general. So one example would be the U.S. treasuries versus German bonds. Uh, we think that those, those rates are likely to converge, or at least the narrow, uh, narrowing of the spread is likely to happen as we reach this bear market case that we think it's likely to unfold. And the third one would be the dollar. You know, if, if you're a believer that we're likely to see some inflows towards um, more of a safe haven assets like treasuries, uh, really across the entire curve, 
curve, because the two-year yields are also very attractive, all the way to the 30-year yields uh, relative to global rates, uh, then you would think that that would cause an inflows to the dollar. So I'm here giving you a case for gold, but at the same time, I'm actually very bullish on the dollar, uh, which we can get into in another conversation, but it's, it's the dollar versus uh, places like China or Hong Kong or some places in Europe. Uh, we think that gold in, in yuan terms or renminbi terms or Hong Kong dollar terms, they all look very interesting as well, not just against the dollar. So that's just a, a little bit different takeaway. So it sounds like from a macro perspective, we're getting close to the time where gold should really start, you know, skyrocketing higher. But, you know, what models or what timing tools are you looking at that's helping you determine, you know, now is the time to get in? Yeah, so gold we like as really a safe haven aspect of gold is really attractive to us. So uh, we always go back to reviews on macro views in the U.S. and globally. But we built this model called the Crescent Macro Model. Uh, and the idea here is to acknowledge first that there's not one single factor that works perfectly throughout history, but by combining economic indicators, equity fundamental factors with a few technical indicators, you you can kind of, they all have some sort of high statistical correlation to the changes in the market. It can help you at least to find or figure out where we are in this business cycle, what stage are we in. So we built this model. Right now we're about two percentage points uh, from over record overvalue levels. And what's interesting about this model is it goes back all the way to 1987. And uh, it, it perfectly timed the peak of the, the two last housing, the housing and the tech bubble as well, and the bottoms as well. And today it actually reached the overvalue stage in September of 2015 which was a time when uh, we had emerging markets blowing up, as you remember, it, oil prices were uh, going, dropping significantly. And at the same time, you had U.S. stocks in December that sell off, the, which was the correction that we had, was saved the markets really, was that the Federal Reserve paused its rate hike cycle, and then that kind of extended the business cycle. And it's kind of interesting um, how when you, when you really research credit markets today, it's really telling you a very different story from what we think it's likely to happen in this scenario. So a lot of investors are kind of oblivious, believing that we're going to see another 2016 soft landing scenario when I think it's actually going to be very different. So Tavi, you're saying we're at the end of the business cycle, is that right? That's right. And one way to look at that is credit markets because they tend to serve as a bellwether for stocks, historically at least. Most people have been looking at the three-month versus 10-year yields and some other spreads that kind of got inverted recently, and rightly so. It's very important. But we like to, we build a much more comprehensive way of looking at credit markets in general. And we're looking at the, all possible 44 spreads of an U.S. yield curve and calculating how many of those are actually inverted. Today, about 50% of those spreads are actually inverted, which is just as high as it was at the housing and the tech bubble as well. And what's interesting about that is when you link back to the 2016 environment, it, you know, in 2016, though the number of the percentage of yield curve inversions was actually below 20. Uh, so right now, being at a close to 50, and that number kind of changes on a daily basis, but about 50%, it's, it's a pretty, pretty alarming situation. We think credit markets are pricing in uh, perhaps a recession in the near term, which is likely to develop as a bear market first, so most times develops with the bear market first. What's important about inversions is that first, uh, they tend to be uh, a great times for you. When you have inversions, it tends to be a great time for you to buy gold, precious metals in general. Um, and most importantly is gold to S&P 500 ratio that tends to rise in moments when you have the inversion. One way to look at that is looking at the five-year yield versus Fed funds rate and the three-year yield versus Fed funds rate. When they invert, first, you're at the peak of the cycle. But also, most importantly, it tends to be great times for you to buy gold relative to U.S. stocks. We've seen this twice. And the interesting thing about gold to S&P 500 ratio is that it's, it's actually forming a pattern that is very, it resembles the global financial crisis of 08 and 07 uh, in a way of, you know, it kind of broke out from this multi-year resistance line recently. It broke out with authority in December with the sell-off in stocks and the fourth quarter uh, kind of madness that we had globally. Um, and then it kind of, with this bounce since the year, uh, this, this 2019 year, it kind of bounced back to the resistance line and it's been, uh, it's been kind of retesting that line, which is very similar to what happened in 06. 06 that ratio also broke out from a multi-year resistance line and then retested back to that line. And that was an interesting time because that was the retest was in 07, right at the beginning of the, the housing crisis that began to unfold. And that was, uh, that was an interesting time because also it marked the, the, the increasing volatility period for equities. Uh, and you can see that by looking at the VIX. The VIX was forming higher lows uh, until all the way to, to the end of the crisis. And we think that we just enter a very similar pattern today. And so how does the Fed affect your thesis? Yeah, we, 
We looked at this, uh, I think it's a must watch, it should be in everyone's must watch list and their monitors if you're an investor, is the two year yields. And the two year yields, it's a very simple, it has a perfect track record of, of looking back and predicting recessions in severe bear markets. So if you, if you put out in a chart the two year yields all the way back to the 70s and 80s, and then you kind of connected the tops and, and create this resistance line as well, if you will. And then every time this two year yields touch the resistance lines and fall significantly, you're at the peak of a cycle. It happened in the double dip recession in the early 80s, the tech bubble and the housing bubble again, and it's happening today. So basically you're saying that the Fed pausing or cutting rates isn't necessarily bullish for stocks. Absolutely, that's correct. I, I, I don't think it's bullish at all. Uh, and one way, uh, we think that be aware or concern every time the credit markets are starting to price in that the Fed is gonna start to cut rates or ease anytime soon, especially at late stages of the cycle. That has never been a bullish sign. It's actually been a very bearish sign historically. And so gold correlates pretty highly with real yields. What are you looking at there? Yeah, so that's a good point. So if we think that nominal rates are gonna be falling significantly, like I showed before, um, real yields are likely to fall as well. And the interesting part about real yields is that if you invert the real yields and put that with gold prices, they've tracked each other really closely. And that's not a surprise for a lot of people, but what's interesting about real yields, if you looked at US five-year real yields inverted, uh, it just broke out from also a, a multi-year resistance line. If that continuation of that pot pattern is likely to happen and continue, uh, we think that gold prices could rise much further and follow the same pattern. And so Tavi, before you mentioned gold priced in Chinese yuan, can you please talk a little bit more about that and why you think it's important? Sure, absolutely. So we think, as I said, China is the largest credit bubble we've seen in history. It's about $40 trillion on, on balance sheet uh, assets that they have. And off balance sheet, they put out this stability report, uh, financial stability report every December of every year. Uh, they admitted to another $45 trillion off balance sheet assets. So we put that together, and actually in a conservative way, it's been a growth of about 400% uh, since the global financial crisis in a normalized terms um, of, of on, on balance sheet banking assets. What you find there is that uh, we think that the consequential damage of all this debt build up in the Chinese economic model really will have a problem with the Chinese currency. Um, one way you can see that is actually on the current account problem. So uh, first, we've seen the current account declining in China, but if you plot that with very, several countries all the way back to the global financial crisis. So if you look, you know, just the change in current account uh, from where the global financial crisis levels were to today, you have Argentina that shrank their current account significantly, and then at the same time, they lost close to 90% of the value of their currency. And today, China is actually the only currency in the world, the Chinese renminbi is the only currency in the world that actually appreciated since the global financial crisis, at the same time as, as its current account balance actually shrank significantly. If you put that in a quadrant, there are other countries that are very close to that, like the Hong Kong dollar and the Saudi Arabia, they're all packed currencies, but we just think that you know this is this is kind of unsustainable now you know you have this it, it, this in data growth model for many years and now the current account is turning negative uh, if, if that's if that's going to continue to happen we're likely to see a devaluation of the yuan so what we like about it is that if you study back in history uh, the you know the how credit markets are, are credit bust tend to develop themselves throughout history especially in emerging markets what you find is that sometimes you have a credit bust that um, the, the market the equity market actually rises in the local currency terms, but the currency itself depreciates significantly against the dollar. Now, what you find that is one pattern that tends to happen uh, in credit busts in emerging markets is that gold tends to rise in local currency terms. So we think that uh, one of the best trades out there is that gold in U1 terms is likely to rise significantly. And it's been kind of pegged as a lot of people have been kind of talking about this with a very high correlation uh, between gold and, and USDCNY. But we think that the correlation is, is unsustainable What's essentially going to happen is they're going to break out on uh, gold and local currency terms as the whole crisis in China unfolds. And so your trade idea for today is going long gold in dollars, not Chinese one. Yes. Aren't you a little bit nervous about the potential for the dollar to scream higher? We actually don't disagree with the, the, this bullish thesis on the dollar. We actually like the dollar quite a lot relative to other currencies. Uh, especially the Chinese yuan, Hong Kong dollar, European, other European countries as well. But what's, what's interesting about, about that is that the other thing that 
you know, we've been doing this whole bullish thesis on gold, didn't even mention inflation. Inflation hasn't even been part of it because it's solely due to the, this idea that we think that the global markets are kind of this negative outlook for global markets in general. It kind of overdue for a recession in a bear market. So we really like the safe haven aspect of gold mostly. If this thesis, this bear case is going to really unfold, we think gold is in a very, very good situation. What we've seen in history is that central banks tend to resort back to money printing and excessive monetary uh, uh, policies to, to really uh, prop up markets to continue to go up. And we think that that's just going to be very beneficial for gold and precious metals in general. One way you can look at that is uh, Russell 3000, for instance, relative to silver. It's, you know, Russell 3000 is more of your broad uh, US stocks kind of index. And it's, it's a very interesting ratio because when you looked at that relative to silver, uh, it, it kind of formed this almost perfect double top, kind of retesting that really high valuations, crazy valuations we had in the tech bubble period. And then it's now been kind of coming down a little bit. And we think that essentially silver, which is, you could think of silver as a high beta version of gold. Uh, silver is, is historically depressed prices, really, especially relative to, uh, to, to broad market in, in general for equities in the US. So we think US equities are, are most likely going to fall, and at, at the same time as silver price. So this is not just a bullish thesis on gold itself, but also on silver. So break it all down for us, Tavi. You know, what vehicle would you use? What's your target? What's your stop loss? And over what time horizon do you expect this thesis to play out? So we've seen kind of a, a global imbalances all over um, and also this record valuations for asset prices at the same time as kind of this um, nonsense reliance on central banks will be able to continue to prop up markets, which in our view is really a recipe for a hard lending scenario. At least that's what we've seen in history. So we think that gold and precious metals will really benefit from that. Uh, for the, your average investor, it would be maybe GLD, the ETF. We think GLD will reach the 145 level in one year from now, and our stop loss is at 111. Tavi, that was great. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Jake. Appreciate it. So Tavi is bullish on gold. Specifically, he suggests buying the Spider Gold Shares ETF, ticker symbol GLD, at 120 with a stop loss at 111 and a target price of 145 over the next 12 months. That was Tavi Costa of Crestcat Capital, and for Real Vision, I'm Jake Merle.